During the 19th century, American leaders kept an eye on Nicaragua as a potential site for a transoceanic canal. This requires a much longer route than Panama, but most of it is already navigable through a river and lake. U.S. Navy warships periodically arrived at Nicaraguan ports to protect American interests and fostered U.S. business interests under the strongman rule of President José Santos Zelaya. When Zelaya began courting Europeans for the building of a canal and welcome European business interests, Americans called Zelaya a tyrannical, self-serving, brutal, greedy disturber of Central American peace. As a result, the Taft administration dispatched U.S. military forces in 1909 to aid a rebellion led by General Juan José Estrada, forcing Zelaya into exile. A pact was signed with the Estrada government, making Nicaragua a U.S. financial protectorate, which is a colonial status similar to that imposed on the Dominican Republic. In 1912, U.S. military forces were sent again, this time to suppress a revolt against the government of Adolfo Diaz, the heir to Estrada. In November, Diaz ran unopposed, and his victory was celebrated with a reception aboard the USS California. To deter further challenges, some 100 U.S. Marines remained as a presidential guard. In 1926, a political faction led by Juan Batista Sacasa, pictured, declared himself president based on liberal policies supported by most Nicaraguans and local leaders. His government was promptly recognized by Mexico. American Secretary of State Frank Kellogg warned of, quote, Mexican fostered Bolsovich hegemony intervening between the United States and the Panama Canal. President Calvin Coolidge ordered U.S. warships and more Marines to Nicaragua. Under Secretary of State Robert Olds candidly explained the reason for this intervention in a memorandum dated January 2, 1927. Quote, There is no room for any outside influence other than ours in this region. Until now, Central America has always understood that governments which we recognize and support stay in power, while those which we do not recognize and support fall. President Coolidge told Congress that, quote, disturbances and conditions in Nicaragua seriously threaten American lives and property and endanger the stability of all Central America. The Americans negotiated a compromise between the two factions, but one general refused to sign the agreement. Augusto Cesar Sadino, pictured, and his followers kept their arms and vowed to fight the Yankee invaders. Sandino supporters were poor farmers, artisans, miners, and indigenous groups in the northern provinces. He demanded independence from foreign influence, ending the monopoly of large coffee farms owned by American and British corporations, increased wages, and restoring expropriated Indian lands. The first battle took place on July 16, 1927, when Sandino and some 400 men attacked a U.S. Marine camp near the Honduran border. The Marines, numbering less than 100, held out with the aid of airplanes fitted with machine guns and bombs. By April 1928, the number of Marines had grown to 5,700 and 21 had been killed. That month, Sandino's army blew up two American-owned mines known for treating their workers poorly. The U.S. press began describing their intervention as a war rather than a police operation, and some questioned the official view of Sandino as a bandit rather than a patriot or revolutionary with genuine political grievances. The Marines, shown here with a captured flag, were accused of assaulting and raping Nicaraguan women. Some of Sandino's men were known to torture and execute civilians suspected of helping the enemy. Marine Corps airplanes bombed what they believed were Sandinista camps, killing hundreds of innocent civilians. Sandino offered a compromise to lay down his arms if the Marines left. American Senator George Norris of Nebraska, pictured, said that the Coolidge administration had, quote, used the armed forces of the United States to destroy human life, to burn villages, to bomb innocent women and children from the air, end quote. Senator William King of Utah added, quote, In the case of those poor, defenseless people of Nicaragua, we send our armies down there 
and our airplanes, and we drop bombs upon their little villages and hamlets and destroy and kill and wound and burn. Americans pressing for the withdrawal of Marines included religious and women's peace groups, socialists, communists, and a dozen progressive U.S. senators. They charged that the intervention was illegal and Congress had not properly authorized it, that the situation in Nicaragua was not a national security issue and thus required no military intervention. President Herbert Hoover acknowledged international and domestic criticism in his first State of the Union address on July 3, 1929, declaring his intention to withdraw some 1,600 U.S. troops from Nicaragua after the U.S. train Guardia Nacional was ready to take over. This national police force, it was thought, would allow the United States to maintain economic control of Nicaragua regardless of who was president. On July 5, 1931, five days after eight Marines had been killed in an ambush, the U.S. Senate passed a non-binding Sense of the Senate resolution calling for American forces to be immediately withdrawn from Nicaragua. One year later, with still no withdrawal, Congress passed a bill prohibiting the administration from transporting additional U.S. troops to Nicaragua. The Hoover administration finally withdrew all U.S. troops in January 1933 and turned the Guardia Nacional over to their chosen commander, Anastasio Somoza Garcia, a graduate of the Pierce Commercial College in Philadelphia. General Somoza maneuvered his way into the presidency in 1936 to begin a 43-year family dynasty through a series of manipulated elections supported by the U.S. government. Somozans used the army to spy on opponents, enrich themselves, and suppress dissent. The last in the line of the Somoza family dictatorships, Anastasio Somoza de Baye, was overthrown in 1979 by rebels bearing the name of Sandino, the Sandinista National Liberation Front, ending a century of American colonial rule of Nicaragua. The Sandino War cost the lives of an estimated 3,000 Nicaraguans and 136 U.S. Marines were killed. Bill Gandahl served with the Marines in Nicaragua during this war. Many years later, at age 77, he reflected on his service there. We marched to Lyon and then to Managua, in, often in dust up to our knees. Uh, when we got to Managua, we were put into Campo de Marte, which was on top of the hill overlooking Managua. Uh, then we started to fight the Sandinistas, which we were told were bandits. We burned houses, we raped women. I personally took part in rapes of women. One time, 19 Marines raped one woman in Managua. We burned houses, we put bombs into houses. We killed poor people, we didn't know what side they were on, but we killed them anyway. And um, we, uh, uh, we lived like animals, we were animals. Our, uh, we got uh, drunk every night, many times borracho. We went to cantinas with putas and drank all the time drinking and not thinking very much for ourselves. And the propaganda we heard all the time was that uh, Sandino was a bandit and uh, Samosa was a patriot. Uh, we've chased Sandino all over Nicaragua with aviones, with troops. We tried to buy traders. No campesinos would, uh, would uh, inform on Sandino. Even when we put a gun to their head, they refused to talk. Even when we shot them, uh, shot their woman, their children, they would not tell where Sandino was. We searched all over, in the mountains, patrols, many of our Marines were killed, and uh, uh, we still committed terrible acts of atrocities against the Nicaraguan people. We ran their railroads, and we took the money from the railroad and gave it to the banks. We took the money from the fincas, the coffee, the sugar, 
uh, other things, and we gave it to the fruit company, United Fruit, and other companies. Um, we uh, tried to drown the struggle, Sandino's struggle and the, his army in blood, but we did not succeed. Uh, finally, we had to leave. We were forced to leave, but we were losing too many men, not only from Sandino and the bullets, but from sickness, from malaria, typhoid, typhus, black water fever, tetanus, other things. And uh, finally, the United States decided that the situation was safe for the banks and for Somoza. We trained the National Guard. I personally trained the National Guard with, and I was a commandante in the National Guard with other Marines. And we trained them to be as crazy as we were.